In mathematics, an irrational number is any real number that cannot be expressed as a ratio of integers. Irrational numbers cannot be represented as terminating or repeating decimals. As a consequence of Cantor's proof that the real numbers are uncountable and the rationals countable, it follows that almost all real numbers are irrational. When the ratio of lengths of two line segments is irrational, the line segments are also described as being incommensurable, meaning they share no measure in common. Numbers which are irrational include the ratio pi of a circle's circumference to its diameter, Euler's number e, the golden ratio phi, and the square root of 2. In fact all square roots of natural numbers, other than of perfect squares, are irrational. History Ancient Greece The first proof of the existence of irrational numbers is usually attributed to a Pythagorean, who probably discovered them while identifying sides of the pentagram. But then current Pythagorean method would have claimed that there must be some sufficiently small, indivisible unit that could fit evenly into one of these lengths as well as the other. However, Hippasus, in the 5th century BC, was able to deduce that there was in fact no common unit of measure, and that the assertion of such an existence was in fact a contradiction. He did this by demonstrating that if the hypotenuse of an isosceles right triangle was indeed commensurable with a leg, then that unit of measure must be both odd and even, which is impossible. His reasoning is as follows. Start with an isosceles right triangle with side lengths of integers a, b, and c. The ratio of the hypotenuse to a leg is represented by c, b. Assume a, b, and c are in the smallest possible terms. By the Pythagorean theorem, c2 equals a2 plus b2 equals b2 plus b2 equals 2b2. Since c2 equals 2b2, c2 is divisible by 2, and therefore even. Since c2 is even, c must be even. Since c and b have no common factors, and c is even, b must be odd. Since c is even, dividing c by 2 yields an integer. Let y be this integer. Squaring both sides of c equals 2y yields c2 equals 2, or c2 equals 4y2. Substituting 4y2 for c2 in the first equation gives us 4y2 equals 2b2. Dividing by 2 yields 2y2 equals b2. Since y is an integer, and 2y2 equals b2, b2 is divisible by 2, and therefore even. Since b2 is even, b must be even. However, we have already asserted that b must be odd, and b cannot be both odd and even. This contradiction proves that c and b cannot both be integers, and thus the existence of a number that cannot be expressed as a ratio of two integers. Greek mathematicians termed this ratio of incommensurable magnitudes allogos, or inexpressible. Hippasus, however, was not lauded for his efforts. According to one legend, he made his discovery while out at sea, and was subsequently thrown overboard by his fellow Pythagoreans, dot, for having produced an element in the universe which denied the doctrine that all phenomena in the universe can be reduced to whole numbers and their ratios. Another legend states that Hippasus was merely exiled for this. Revelation. Whatever the consequence to Hippasus himself, his discovery posed a very serious problem to Pythagorean mathematics, since it shattered the assumption that number and geometry were inseparable a foundation of their theory. The discovery of incommensurable ratios was indicative of another problem facing the Greeks, the relation of the discrete to the continuous brought into light by Zeno of Ella, who questioned the conception that quantities are discrete and composed of a finite number of units of a given size. Past Greek conceptions dictated that they necessarily must be, for whole numbers represent discrete objects, 
and a commensurable ratio represents a relation between two collections of discrete objects. However, Zeno found that in fact, quantities in general are not discrete collections of units. This is why ratios of incommensurable quantities appear. Q quantities are, in other words, continuous. What this means is that, contrary to the popular conception of the time, there cannot be an indivisible smallest unit of measure for any quantity, that in fact these divisions of quantity must necessarily be infinite. For example, consider a line segment. This segment can be split in half, that half split in half, the half of the half in half, and so on. This process can continue infinitely, for there is always another half to be split. The more times the segment is halved, the closer the unit of measure comes to zero, but it never reaches exactly zero. This is just what Zeno sought to prove. He sought to prove this by formulating four paradoxes, which demonstrated the contradictions inherent in the mathematical thought of the time. While Zeno's paradoxes accurately demonstrated the deficiencies of current mathematical conceptions, they were not regarded as proof of the alternative. In the minds of the Greeks, disproving the validity of one view did not necessarily prove the validity of another, and therefore further investigation had to occur. The next step was taken by Eudoxus of Cnidus, who formalized a new theory of proportion that took into account commensurable as well as incommensurable quantities. Central to his idea was the distinction between magnitude and number. A magnitude dot was not a number, but stood for entities such as line segments, angles, areas, volumes, and time which could vary, as we would say, continuously. Magnitudes were opposed to numbers, which jumped from one value to another, as from 4 to 5, numbers are composed of some smallest, indivisible unit whereas magnitudes are infinitely reducible, because no quantitative values were assigned to magnitudes. Eudoxus was then able to account for both commensurable and incommensurable ratios by defining a ratio in terms of its magnitude, and proportion as an equality between two ratios. By taking quantitative values out of the equation, he avoided the trap of having to express an irrational number as a number. Eudoxus' theory enabled the Greek mathematicians to make tremendous progress in geometry by supplying the necessary logical foundation for incommensurable ratios. Book 10 is dedicated to classification of irrational magnitudes. As a result of the distinction between number and magnitude, geometry became the only method that could take into account incommensurable ratios, because previous numerical foundations were still incompatible with the concept of incommensurability. Greek focus shifted away from those numerical conceptions such as algebra and focused almost exclusively on geometry. In fact, in many cases algebraic conceptions were reformulated into geometrical terms. This may account for why we still conceive of x2 or x3 as x squared and x cubed instead of x second power and x third power. Also crucial to Zeno's work with incommensurable magnitudes was the fundamental focus on deductive reasoning that resulted from the foundational shattering of earlier Greek mathematics. The realization that some basic conception within the existing theory was at odds with reality necessitated a complete and thorough investigation of the axioms and assumptions that comprised that theory. Out of this necessity Eudoxus developed his method of exhaustion, a kind of reductio ad absurdum that established the deductive organization on the basis of explicit axioms, as well as reinforced the earlier decision to rely on deductive reasoning for proof. This method of exhaustion is the first step in the creation of calculus. Theodorus of Cyrene proved the irrationality of the thirds of whole numbers, up to 17.
but stopped there probably because the algebra he used couldn't be applied to the square root of 17. It wasn't until Eudoxus developed a theory of proportion that took into account irrational as well as rational ratios that a strong mathematical foundation of irrational numbers was created. India geometrical and mathematical problems involving irrational numbers such as square roots were addressed very early during the Vedic period in India and there are references to such calculations in the Samhitas, Brahmanas and more notably in the Sulba Sutras. 1990, it is suggested that the concept of irrationality was implicitly accepted by Indian mathematicians since the 7th century BC, when Manavar believed that the square roots of numbers such as 2 and 61 could not be exactly determined. However, historian Carl Benjamin Boyer writes that such claims are not well substantiated and unlikely to be true. It is also suggested that Hayabata, in calculating a value of pi to five significant figures, used the word asana to mean that not only is this an approximation but that the value is incommensurable. Later, in their treatises, Indian mathematicians wrote on the arithmetic of thirds including addition, subtraction, multiplication, rationalization, as well as separation and extraction of square roots. 1993, mathematicians like Brahmagupta and Bhaskara I made contributions in this area as did other mathematicians who followed. In the 12th century Bhaskara II evaluated some of these formulas and critiqued them, identifying their limitations. During the 14th to 16th centuries, Madhava of Sangamagrama in the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics discovered the infinite series for several irrational numbers such as pi, and certain irrational values of trigonometric functions. Just Hadiva provided proofs for these infinite series in the Yuktavasa, Middle Ages in the Middle Ages. The development of algebra by Muslim mathematicians allowed irrational numbers to be treated as algebraic objects. Middle Eastern mathematicians also merged the concepts of number and magnitude into a more general idea of real numbers, criticized Euclid's idea of ratios, developed the theory of composite ratios, and extended the concept of number to ratios of continuous magnitude. In his commentary on Book 10 of the Elements, the Persian mathematician Al-Mahani examined and classified quadratic irrationals and cubic irrationals. He provided definitions for rational and irrational magnitudes, which he treated as irrational numbers. He dealt with them freely but explains them in geometric terms as follows. It will be irrational when we, for instance, say 10, 12, 3%, 6%, etc., because its value is pronounced and expressed quantitatively. What is not rational is irrational and it is impossible to pronounce and represent its value quantitatively. For example, the roots of numbers such as 10, 15, 20 which are not squares, the sides of numbers which are not cubes etc. In contrast to Euclid's concept of magnitudes as lines, Al-Mahani considered integers and fractions as rational magnitudes, and square roots and cube roots as irrational magnitudes. He also introduced an arithmetical approach to the concept of irrationality, as he attributes the following to irrational magnitudes, their sums or differences, or results of their addition to a rational magnitude, or results of subtracting a magnitude of this kind from an irrational one, or of a rational magnitude from it. The Egyptian mathematician Abu Kamal Shujar ibn Aslam was the first to accept irrational numbers as solutions to quadratic equations or as coefficients in an equation, often in the form of square roots, cube roots and fourth roots. In the 10th century, the Iraqi mathematician al-Hashimi provided general proofs for irrational numbers, as he considered multiplication, division, and other arithmetical functions. Iranian mathematician Abu Jafar al kazin provides a definition of rational and irrational magnitudes, stating that if a definite quantity is contained in a certain given magnitude once or many times, then this magnitude corresponds to a rational number.
each time when this magnitude comprises a half, or a third, or a quarter of the given magnitude, or, compared with, comprises three, five, or three-fifths, it is a rational magnitude, and, in general, each magnitude that corresponds to this magnitude, as one number to another, is rational. If, however, a magnitude cannot be represented as a multiple, a part, or parts of a given magnitude, it is irrational, i.e., it cannot be expressed other than by means of roots. Many of these concepts were eventually accepted by European mathematicians sometime after the Latin translations of the 12th century. al hassa a Moroccan mathematician from Fez specializing in Islamic inheritance jurisprudence during the 12th century, first mentions the use of a fractional bar, where numerators and denominators are separated by a horizontal bar. In his discussion, he writes, for example, if you are told to write three-fifths and a third of a fifth, write thus. This same fractional notation appears soon after in the work of Leonardo Fibonacci in the 13th century. Modern period The 17th century saw imaginary numbers become a powerful tool in the hands of Abraham de Moivre, and especially of Leonhard Euler. The completion of the theory of complex numbers in the 19th century entailed the differentiation of irrationals into algebraic and transcendental numbers. The proof of the existence of transcendental numbers, and the resurgence of the scientific study of the theory of irrationals, largely ignored since Euclid. The year 1872 saw the publication of the theories of Carl Weiss Trass, Edward Heine, Georg Cantor, and Richard Dedekind. Mary had taken in 1869 the same point of departure as Heine, but the theory is generally referred to the year 1872. Weiss Trass's method has been completely set forth by Salvatore Pinchula in 1880 and Didi Kins has received additional prominence through the author's later work and the endorsement by Paul Tannery. Weir's Trass, Cantor, and Heine base their theories on infinite series, while Dedekind founds his on the idea of a cut in the system of real numbers, separating all rational numbers into two groups having certain characteristic properties. The subject has received later contributions at the hands of Weir's Trass, Leopold Kronecker, and Charles Meret. Continued fractions, closely related to irrational numbers, received attention at the hands of Euler, and at the opening of the 19th century were brought into prominence through the writings of Joseph Louis Lagrange. Dirichlet also added to the general theory, as have numerous contributors to the applications of the subject. Johann Heinrich Lambert proved that pi cannot be rational, and that n is irrational if n is rational. While Lambert's proof is often called incomplete, modern assessments support it as satisfactory, and in fact for its time it is unusually rigorous. Adrien Marie Legendre, after introducing the Bessel Clifford function, provided a proof to show that π2 is irrational, whence it follows immediately that π is irrational also. The existence of transcendental numbers was first established by Liouville. Later, Georg Cantor proved their existence by a different method that showed that every interval in the rails contains transcendental numbers. Charles Hermite first proved E transcendental, and Ferdinand von Lindemann, starting from Hermite's conclusions, showed the same for Pi. Lindemann's proof was much simplified by Weir's Trass, still further by David Hilbert, and was finally made elementary by Adolf Hurwitz and Paul Gordon. Example proofs Square roots The square root of 2 was the first number proved irrational, and that article contains a number of proofs. The golden ratio is another famous quadratic irrational and there is a simple proof of its irrationality in its article. The square roots of all natural numbers which are not perfect squares are irrational and a proof may be found in quadratic irrationals. General roots The proof above for the square root of 2 can be generalized using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. This asserts that every integer has a unique factorization into primes. 
Using it we can show that if a rational number is not an integer then no integral power of it can be an integer. As in lowest terms there must be a prime in the denominator that does not divide into the numerator whatever power each is raised to. Therefore if an integer is not an exact kth power of another integer then its kth root is irrational. Logarithms Perhaps the numbers most easy to prove irrational are certain logarithms. Here is a proof by contradiction that log 2 3 is irrational. Notice that log 2 3 1.58 greater than 0. Assume log 2 3 is rational. For some positive integers m and n, we have it follows that however, the number 2 raised to any positive integer power must be even and the number 3 raised to any positive integer power must be odd. Clearly, an integer cannot be both odd and even at the same time. We have a contradiction. The only assumption we made was that log 2 3 is rational. The contradiction means that this assumption must be false, i.e., log 2 3 is irrational, and can never be expressed as a quotient of integers m, n with n 0. Cases such as log 10 2 can be treated similarly. Transcendental and algebraic irrationals Almost all irrational numbers are transcendental and all real transcendental numbers are irrational. The article on transcendental numbers lists several examples. E R and pi R are irrational if R0 is rational, E pi is irrational. Another way to construct irrational numbers is as irrational algebraic numbers, i.e., as zeros of polynomials with integer coefficients. Start with a polynomial equation where the coefficients are integers. Suppose you know that there exists some real number x with p equals 0. The only possible rational roots of this polynomial equation are of the form r per second where r is a divisor of a0 and s is a divisor of n. There are only finitely so many such candidates you can check by hand. If neither of them is a root of p, then x must be irrational. For example, this technique can be used to show that x equals one-third is irrational. We have 2 equals 2, and hence x 6 minus 2 by 3 minus 1 equals 0, and this latter polynomial does not have any rational roots. Because the algebraic numbers form a field, many irrational numbers can be constructed by combining transcendental and algebraic numbers. For example 3 pi plus 2, pi plus square root 2 and e square root 3 are irrational.